Good evening, everybody. Great to see you all. I hope those of you that attended the big weekend in Nottingham a few weeks ago have recovered now. It really was a fantastic event, and it was great to see you all there. Um, last weekend, I attended the big round table weekend, which was actually Matt Eaton's ball in Colchester. Um, great night. Uh, tables in good hands. They are growing again. And uh, they reported that they were the biggest uh, contributor to the food banks in the country, collecting enough food to feed 25,000 for a week, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and this is one reason why our table's growing again, because they're out in the community more again, which is brilliant news. Um, I'll just tell you about our for, open for forthcoming events. 3rd of November, we've got Rory uh, and myself on the gardening programme. We visited the um, show up in Man Manchester, the RHS show at Tampa Park, where Rory was doing a stand. Uh, we were supposed to spend the day there. I think I saw Rory for about five minutes. Uh, but fortunately, wandering around, I did find another table of their exhibiting. So I think he's on film as well, all being well, isn't he, Colin? Yeah. Uh, 10th of November, we've got a tangent uh, gin tasting night. I hope they've got some 41 gin in the tasting, otherwise there'll be trouble. Uh, 24th of November, we've got meet the 41 club board meeting, which will be a bit of a insight into what we're doing in the, on the board and what we've been doing the past 18, 19 months during lockdown and everything, uh, which should be great. Uh, open, open for questions. Um, we've got a fantastic speaker tonight. This young lady's come at my request, actually. We had a Connect meeting last year, getting speakers together, and I suggested that we had Ruth. Because I heard Ruth speak at an Area 14 table meeting. Can't remember how long ago. A long time ago, wasn't it, Ruth? And there was about 60 to 70 guys in a room, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. She gives a very emotional, uh, moving story. And uh, I'll hand over to Jim now, Jim, who will give the introduction. I did ask Jim to contact Ruth on my behalf because I knew Jim was still in a circle. <laughs> <He'd have the laughs> contacts. <laughs> so over to you, Jim. Thank you, President Peter. Well, it's better to be in circle than tangent now, isn't it? So, <laughs> um, well, what can we say about Ruth Curry? My, my wife, Vicky, has known Ruth for around about 12 years now. Um, and she told me that Ruth was quite simply the most amazing woman she's ever met. So we had to have her along to connect speaking and you will all be able to see why tonight. Um, Ruth will do a presentation and after there'll be an opportunity to ask questions by the chat function. If you put your question in there, I'll be happy to ask Ruth at the end. Um, and I'm sure Ruth will be happy to answer the questions as well. Um, I don't wanna to say too much because the story is best coming from Ruth herself. It's fair to say that she and her family have faced so much adversity over the years and yet they sit down, make a plan and just get on with it. I've heard what you're going to hear tonight at a few meetings when Ruth has related the various events that have made her life so interesting and it never ceases to amaze me and it never ceases to move me. It therefore gives me great pleasure to introduce Past Lady Circle President, Past Lady Circle International Secretary but most importantly a great friend for whom I have the utmost respect and admiration, the amazing Ruth Curry. Over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Peter, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background um, and um, I'm going to share some pictures. Um, unfortunately, don't have all the pictures of my, my life. Um, you will understand a bit later why. Um, and... Um, as, as uh, Jim said, if you do have any questions, more than happy to answer these after the event, after the chat. Um, so um, I'm going to just share my screen with you now. Um, I think I may lose um, the vision of everybody. But Jim, if anybody if needs me to stop, could you just shout and um, I will stop straight away. I will do. Thank you. Right. Let me just share my screen. Let's try and do it with the sound this time.
Right, so my story starts in Africa. Um, I was born in Zimbabwe. Um, I am um, one of the generation uh, from the families that went out um, to Africa in the late 40s, early 50s um, to build up the, the new generation of what was then Rhodesia, uh, bringing in all the, the trades and, and the industry uh, to help get Rhodesia up, on, uh, up and running and, and the bits that were missing. So my granddad from my dad's side, um, he was a sheet metal worker ex uh, RAF, um, so it's where he did learn his trade to build the aircraft. Um, he went out with his main focus to rebuild or to build um, the railway carriages for what they wanted to build was the railways um, to get around uh, Rhodesia as it was in the time. Um, he went out with my gran and my dad, and my uncle Dave. Uh, dad was very little. He was probably I would say probably about eight, not much older than that. Um, and then my mum, um, her dad was a fireman and um, he went out to help build the fire crew and service and get all of that up and running and to train uh, the personnel out there. Uh, there were both families only supposed to go out for a short period of time, um, just get things up and running and with the aim of coming back to, to England once they'd done their little journey. However, they never did come back, they stayed and they started their lives. Um, and that's kind of where I came along. Um, and um, my husband's side, very similar story. Um, his grandparents moved out from Wales out to uh, Rhodesia that was at the time. Um, and Wayne's granddad was actually part of the insurance uh, industry. And he went out to help look after the insuring of the tobacco uh, that was being grown at the time and shipping that back to, uh, to Europe. Um, and they, they remained. They didn't come back um, and then Wayne's family was then um, grown from there. Um, I went on um, to have my three kids in Zimbabwe as well, so they were second generation African. Um, but I'm going to talk about more about them in a bit. So uh, this is a story why Africa is in my blood. Um, there is a, a saying that once Africa, once you've been to Africa, Africa will always be with you. Um, and despite what happened, I will never um, never changed the feeling it, it always remained home as though I'm very grateful to have a new home here in the UK um, Zimbabwe will always be home um, so you will hear me refer to it very often as home I am referring to Zimbabwe at the time so uh, the picture you can see on the screen um, is actually a photograph that um, Zoe Gaskell took uh, when we went to Zambia and it was quite a precious moment it was when I got to meet with my Zim friends um, who've known a long time um, all circlers um, and we kind of got to know each other through the journey of Lady Circle. I didn't know prior to Lady Circle, but they took me in as one of their own and, and it was just nice to be accepted um, even though I was no longer there. Uh, the picture you can see in the bottom uh, left-hand corner is a photograph which is taken from the bottom of our land and it looks into the valley. Um, so those are the mountains. Those mountains you can see there are the mountains into Mozambique. So we were right on the Mozambique border. Absolutely spectacular. Um, and then we often get confused when you tell people you're from Zimbabwe, they think you're from South Africa, and it actually is a very different country. Uh, so South Africa is the very base of Africa, um, and in the picture you can see I've got uh, Zimbabwe highlighted in orange. So it's a landlocked country, um, so we're bordered with uh, Mozambique, Zambia, Botswana, and South Africa. Right, so to tell you a little bit about my family, um, I um, am married to an amazing man. A uh, guy called Wayne, I met him when I was 16. He was my next door neighbor. The thing is, I didn't know he was my next door neighbor because the properties are so big at home. So you just don't know <laughs> all your neighbors. Um, and when I had seen people coming in and out of there, I'd seen his parents and his grandparents. So I kind of didn't realize it was a rather, rather lovely hunk living next door. Um, anyway, I met him when I was 16. Um, he was my first boyfriend. Um, we got married. Um, and went on to have three gorgeous kids um, and uh, they're all doing incredibly well but I'll explain how they're doing from now. So um, we've got uh, Michael who's the eldest um, who was born in Marindera which is a farming farming community just outside Harare. Um, no decent hospitals in Marindera so I actually ended up having him in an old age home. Uh, Many was going to have him at home, but I ran into complications. So um, he was actually delivered in an old age home called Borrow Little Trust. And they were absolutely brilliant. Then I got Shanalee. Uh, Shanalee is our daughter in the middle. 
Um, Shanali, again, didn't have it in a hospital. I landed up um, delivering her before I even got to the hospital because we're so far from a local hospital with three hours. I actually landed up delivering her in the back of my dad's car. So that didn't go too, too much to plan, but she was absolutely fine. And then we've got little Dan, who's actually not quite so little anymore. Uh, he's a great big man now. Um, and Dan, um, I, uh, again, didn't quite get to a hospital again. I landed up having him in a Cheremba surgery, which is basically, um, how can I describe it? It's not even a hospital. It's just a, a room in a, in a, in a comp. It's not even a complex. It's just, it's just a room um, within a, 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 a communal area. Um, and um, I had him in the local surgery there. Uh, the main reason being that um, I had contracted malaria. So um, I went into labor 10 weeks early, but absolutely fine. So Daniel uh, was two weeks old, uh, sorry, two weeks old, two hours old, um, and they sent me home. So none of the special care you get here in the UK, uh, since you've had your baby, you're on your way. So despite him being 10 weeks early and weighing 1.8 kilos, uh, we brought him home. Um, very tiny, um, very jaundiced. But you know what? As Jim says, we made a plan and... Um, it's turned out to a fantastic young man, but I'll tell you a little bit more about their story. So uh, here's some pictures of home. So um, the uh, mountains that you can see is taken from the bottom of our property that we had. And this is Cecil Cop uh, that you can see, which is a, an outcrop at the base of the mountains where we lived um, and backed onto a nature reserve. So uh, we used to get the elephants come down from here. So um, the property that you can see to the um, to the left of your screen. The, the top of the screen is the property as we left it. And the property you can see below is how friends took photographs of it probably about six years after we left. So just totally derelict. Uh, they had ripped up all the parquet floors and uh, totally uh, decimated the property. But I'll explain all of what happened in a little bit. But just to give you an idea, that was our family home, a beautiful, a beautiful farm. Um, the most incredible views. Um, the photograph I've taken is in September. It's just as the masasa is all changing colour. Um, and it's my favourite time of the year, really. And that photo was taken just, just after sunrise. Um, and uh, you can see the clouds there on the mountains, which normally burnt off by, by early morning. There's just a few more pictures of, of our property. So um, this is the dam that we used to overlook um, from our veranda. And this is where the elephants would come down to. Um, early evening um, and they would um, muck about in the water and drink and then head back up to the mountains. Now that dam actually became a dam by mistake. Um, we didn't have much in the way of water at the bottom lands that you can see there which is where we grew um, fresh vegetables and uh, uh, fresh fruit. Um, we used to pump, there was no water down there at all, so we used to pump water up from the mountain, it's beautiful spring water, pump it down um, and then create the dam and that's what we used to water the the, um, the fields with. Um, but we had a borehole that um, continually leaked so uh, we gave up trying to to stop it um, and just let it create a natural pool so uh, the animals would come down to that. So uh, if you see on the left hand screen uh, that was the brander we used to sit on and then it would overlook into the valley which you can see. And then um, the picture to the right um, is just a, a close-up view of the of the water from the from the water edge. So that's pretty much our life. Um, absolutely quiet. Um, it's it was a beautiful place to live. Um, I'd say it was quiet. Um, I grew up during the Rhodesian Bush War um, and I remember standing at my grand's veranda uh, watching all the helicopters and, and planes going over and the bombs coming over at night. So the bombs would come over the, the mountains from Mozambique at night. Had absolutely zero idea how much danger I was in. We thought it was pretty cool, thought it was like fireworks. <laughs> Couldn't understand why my granddad kept taking us into the um, bomb shelter at the base of the, of the house. So um, yeah, that was quite an interesting lifestyle, but when you grow up in a war, that's normal. You don't see it as strange. Uh, you see soldiers walking around streets with guns. That's all quite normal. Uh, my, dad, my dad went and fought in the bush war, so did my uncle, and it was quite normal. So um, as a child, um, who grew up or who's born in the middle of the bush war, um, that was normal. Um, I've subsequently learned that it's, it's far from normal. So my history of joining round tables down to these two amazing people who are my parents. Um, Mum and dad have been tablers before I was even around. I think even before I was thought of. 
Uh, my dad uh, was the public prosecutor in uh, Bulawayo, um, and uh, he then moved uh, to um, Harare, uh, which was Salisbury at the time, where he met my mum, who was the stenographer in the courts. And that's how they met. Um, Dad was very actively involved in Round Table from the Bulawayo days and then went on to join Salisbury Number no. 1, which is now known as Harare Number no. 1 and still running. Um, and my mum was hugely uh, active uh, circular. And um, they were actually known as the uh, Table Legs because it was the girls, it was quite derogatory now, but uh, they referred to the girls as the Table Legs because they circle held up tables. So without the girls, a lot of things wouldn't happen. They sorted out the meeting rooms, they sorted out the meals, they sorted out all the events, um, and they couldn't deliver what they had to deliver without the girls there. So I've grown up in a table and circle my whole life. To me, it's been normal. We would go off to conferences in South Africa with Artsa um, and uh, all over Central Africa with Artka. Um, and to us, that was our family holidays. We had an awesome time and absolutely loved it. Um, and they really taught me the values of what Roundtable is all about uh, and, uh, and the benefit and the value you have of giving to others, not necessarily financial, but of your time and, and, and your efforts. And my folks were epitome of doing this and still very much are. So um, to me, being a circler was what I was going to be because that's what mum did. And I was just in awe of, of the fun that they had. Um, dad persuaded dad to join, uh, persuaded Wayne to join, uh, which he did. Um, and in those days, you had to be married before you could become a circler. So uh, we got married in January 1993. Um, and when we got back from honeymoon in the February, I became a circler as soon as I possibly could, joining Lady Circle in Marindera. Um, and the girls, it was just amazing. And my journey's just been incredible. So uh, very actively involved. Um, didn't really actually even know there was an international circle, believe it or not, um, at that point. Um, so as far as I was aware, it just happened in Zimbabwe but uh, what, uh, and South Africa, but not quite aware of just how big the story is. That, that I learned very much later in my, in my career. So um, mum and dad um, supported, supported um, us and um, they, they were very much influential as to, to Wayne and I joining Table. Table was a massive benefit to Wayne, not only on the social aspect, but uh, on the business aspect as well. So um, most of his clients um, were Tablers and um, all had contacts through Table. So absolutely fantastic. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about my parents. Um, and it's all their fault that I got into this. But... I don't, I don't regret one minute um, of being part of the Roundtable family. Right, so I'm going to give a little bit of information about Zimbabwe um, so, uh, and, and the build-up to the land seizures, which we were impacted in. So um, basically, in about 1880, uh, the first English and Boer settlers arrived. So the Boer settlers are those from uh, Holland and Germany um, and those areas. Um, and then in 1890, Cecil John Rhodes uh, named the land Rhodesia. So that's where the name came from. So taking off the name Rhodes and then putting it into Rhodesia. So it was uh, part of a British, uh, British state. Um, and um, they started to build the infrastructure there and start uh, farming on, a, on a, a rather large commercial scale, which hadn't been done before. It was just subsistence farming. And they started to build it in. Then in July 1964, um, the Rhodesian Bush War began, and this is where um, the, the war veterans, uh, predominantly uh, black population, had uh, said, right, we're not happy, we want our land back, you've stolen it from us um, in, the 19, uh, in the 1880s, we want our land back, um, and th they, they, they took to arms and they fought for the country. The, the war ended in 1979. At that point, I was nine years old. Um, and uh, from there, um, in June, well, in June 1979, um, there, there was um, an agreement that was signed between um, Abel, uh, Abel Muzarewa and Ewan Smith, who was uh, the previous, uh, previous Prime Minister of Rhodesia, um, to basically say so they would do a, a, a joint cohesion of running the country. Um, and uh, Rhodesia was then renamed Zimbabwe Rhodesia, but this was only for a very short period of time. So in December uh, 1979, um, there was an agreement signed, uh, which is known as the Lancaster House Agreement. This was signed in London, uh, where the country was temporarily returned into British control. 
um, until uh, April, until the end of uh, so probably the end of March 1980 when we ran uh, new elections, um, which was under the British and Commonwealth supervision. And in April, 18th of April, 1980, uh, Mugabe became the first prime minister of Zimbabwe. It became uh, a country that achieved uh, international recognition uh, as an independent country, um, and the new Zimbabwe was born. Everything was going great. Everything was great. Um, uh, I grew up in this time. Um, we got married. We'd had our babies by now. Um, and then in 1998, uh, the Zimbabwean government decided that they were going to start what's called the Land Reform and Settlement Programme. And the aim of that was compulsory acquisition of the land. So uh, the agreement was that we do over a five year period and they would be buying a certain number of farms each year over that time where the uh, farmers would be paid for the land. Um, and it would be all done in a controlled uh, manner. And then the farms would be then uh, segregated into smaller plots um, and then uh, passed on to um, the, the local uh, population in the area. Uh, and to allow them to start, uh, so mainly the, uh, the, the black population who at that point were declared as landless, um, to give them the land so that they could then take it over and run the farms. However, it didn't quite work to plan. So in 1998, uh, the war veterans, so these are the guys that had fought in the Rhodesian Bush War, they decided government wasn't working quick enough. So they started to invade the lands. Most of these were the Chemerenga war veterans. So uh, the Rhodesian Bush War, or was known as the Chemerenga War. Um, so they landed up moving onto the farms um, and this then was then taken over. So when the, it was a bit frustrating because there were war, war, war veterans who had fought the war, but then there were a whole lot of ZANU PFUs that then jumped onto the bandwagon and they started getting involved. So they'd never fought a war in their lives. These guys are like 18. They hadn't even been born by the time that the, the war had finished. Uh, but they kind of jumped in um, and they started uh, invading the land. And this was not done peacefully in any way. Then in 2000, there was the Land Acquisition Act uh, for compulsory acquisition of the land without compensation. So this is a slight difference. In 1998, the, the, the farmers were told, we're taking your land, but we'll pay you for it. Um, and this, I think, was under the understanding that the British government would be helping with the, with the funding to do this. But the British government clearly didn't do that. Um, so they just took uh, it into their own hands and said, right, well, we'll have the land anyway. I'm not paying you. You can get off. Quite besides the point that majority of the farmers have either been handed down generation after generation or they had actually bought the land themselves with a mortgage and paid it off very much like Wayne and I had done. So in 2000, we saw the start of the farm invasions uh, without compensation, and it became more and more aggressive and more and more dangerous. Um, and they started to seize the land um, with, the, uh, with the government allowing the war veterans to do it, yet taking no action. So the farmers started to get beaten up. They started to be attacked and nobody was doing anything about it. You called the police. They they would tell you, I haven't got transport, or it's not our problem, it's a domestic issue. It's like, this is not a domestic issue. People are taking over our farm and we're at risk. Nothing happened. And I don't know if anybody remembers the press or if it was even covered in the UK. We lost a lot of farmers um, and it was brutal, absolutely brutal. It wasn't just a bullet to the head. They used to torment and torture and it was it, it just horrific what happened. Um, to, to land, and it wasn't just our white farmers, it was also the black farmers that had the land. They too lost their land. So it wasn't, it, it didn't become a race thing anymore. It, it then became just the, the grand land grab. And it was really tough to see people who put so much work um, to build a life and a future for their families and those who lived on the farm to suddenly be found in the situation. So in 2002, the Land Acquisition uh, Amendment Act was that they were going to fast track the land reform implemented. So forget the five years. We're not doing five years. We all want it and we want it now. End of. So um, in 2002, over 2,900 white owned farms were given 90 days to cease all production um, and vacate their farms. Um, this is when it impacted us. We were farming in Matari. Uh, we received a Section 8 on the 1st of August 2002, um, and we weren't, we weren't given 90 days. We were given 24 hours. 
to get off the land. Um, the unfortunate part of this, um, we had no control, but I'll go into a little bit more detail what happened. But basically over this period, from the time that the, the, the farms were taken over with the, 90, the apparent 90 days, which wasn't actually 90 days, um, agriculture fell by 60% and so did the tobacco. Tobacco being Zimbabweans biggest uh, foreign earner, a foreign exchange earner. Um, and without that, there was no foreign exchange coming into the country. And as a result of that, people couldn't get paid. They lost their jobs. Um, and things started to deteriorate very quickly and very rapidly. So to give you an idea, um, from 2000, um, over a thousand farms were taken. Um, and in that time, uh, 300 farm workers. So that's not the farmers. Those are the guys that are working on the farm. Now, some of those farm workers uh, had been on those farms for three, four, five generations. That to them was home. They had nowhere else to go. They then became jobless and homeless because not only did the farmers get kicked off, but also the farm workers. And they had infrastructure on these farms. So we provided schooling. We provided um, a clinic with a qualified nurse, medication. Um, and we had a high level of, of AIDS um, within our, our, our workforce. Unfortunately, it's something that happens in Africa. It, it's common. Um, we would provide all the medication for that and, and, the, and the, the care that they needed towards the end. Um, and then those uh, families where, um, let's say, mother and father had passed from, um, from AIDS, those, the orphans would be taken in by the local community on the farm and, and treated as their own, continue with the education. We continued providing them with food. Uh, we used to feed all our people on the farm as well. We provided them uh, with morning breakfast. Uh, we would then provide them with uh, morning tea. So morning tea would be like um, fruit and, and, and hot, hot tea midday. And then we'd give a hot lunch, uh, which was sudza, which is a ground maize, uh, together with meat and vegetables. And then the evening again, we would provide them with another meal. So it wasn't just us that did this. There was a lot of other farmers that did the same. So everybody was educated. Uh, so kids were educated. They had their medical, they had a house, they had a place to live. Uh, they had their uniforms provided, um, and you know what? They became part of our families. So when the farmers were kicked off, these people had to go too. And suddenly they were jobless and homeless. And there's a lot of people, 300,000, and that's just in 2000. It progressively got worse and worse. So unfortunately, the invaders who came onto the, the land, they didn't have the knowledge of farming. They didn't know how to grow tobacco or cotton or maize. Or vegetables. They didn't know how to do it. On, they could do it small scale, but on a large commercial scale, they had no idea. Further, they didn't have the equipment to do it, and they didn't have the capital. They couldn't buy the fertilizers. They couldn't buy the wheat suppressants. They couldn't buy the grains. They couldn't buy what they needed to run it on a large scale. And furthermore, there was absolutely no coordination of how this was done, how the takeover was done. So it wasn't in a controlled manner. Just like, oh, I fancy that place. We're moving in. Right. And there was no control at all. And it was just basically lawlessness. So the current population of Zimbabwe right now is uh, just over 15 million. Um, unfortunately, poverty is now affecting 73% of the children living in the rural areas. Um, and it's not just poverty. They're not going to school. They're not getting um, any support. And some of these kids just have nothing. And it's heartbreaking because these kids had something before and suddenly now they don't. Um, roughly 74% of the Zimbabwean population lives on less than five, five US dollars a day. Um, that's not enough. When you think, um, just argue for a second, not that a jar of coffee is, is an essential, but to give you an idea, um, one kilo of coffee currently, like an Escafe coffee, um, is 65 US dollars. So that's just coffee. Bread, you're looking at about 17 US dollars a loaf. Now, Zimbabwe's never quite got to grips with the, the currency conversions right now. So they're still working in the old Zimbabwe dollar, which doesn't exist anymore, and just converted it straight to US. So it's a ridiculously expensive place to live. Um, and that's how it is right now. And, and it's getting worse. Every month it gets worse. So the average wage for those who are actually working in Zimbabwe is 253 US dollars a month. You're looking at about 1500 US dollars a month to rent a house. So and that's not a fancy house. That's just a box standard everyday house. So people cannot afford to, to pay rent. They can't afford to feed themselves. And a lot of people are out of work. It's a critical situation. This all comes down to the fact that 
The Barber used to be the breadbasket of Africa. We fed everybody. We were such a productive country. And then with the loss of all the land production and the loss of the farms being produced, suddenly we can't feed anyone. We can't even feed ourselves anymore. Um, from a country that, as prosperous as it was, to how it is now, it's quite heartbreaking because it didn't have to happen this way. Because if it had been done in a coordinated way and the training had been given to the new farmers that were coming on board, none of this would have happened. It would have been so, so much easier and, and a lot less stressed. But unfortunately, it didn't quite go that way. So we're looking at about just over half of Zimbabweans uh, people now living below the food poverty line. And three and a half million children are chronically hungry. And the kids are dying because they're not been eat, they're not eating. Um, we have dry periods in the year, so there's no water. Um, it only rains uh, roughly between about October and uh, January, and that's it. There's no further rain. So if we run out of water, and you run out of food, there's very little chance for you. Right. So the next part um, I'm going to talk to you is about our invasion. Uh, we were on a beautiful farm um, up in the mountains. Um, which you've seen some pictures of. Uh, we, were gr we weren't big in any form. Uh, we had, a, a, in effect, what they referred to as a small holding. It wasn't even a farm. It's a lot of land here for the UK. Um, but it, it was, we worked hard for it. We took a mortgage out. We paid that mortgage off. We worked damn hard to pay that mortgage off. Um, Wayne opened up a engineering business on the farm as well, because uh, Wayne is actually a trained engineer mainly because we couldn't get spare parts for our tractors and our equipment, and neither could the farmers in the area. So we started up a machine shop, and we used to make spares for all the equipment, um, including all the, the local community. Um, it was a bit of a thriving business, actually, and we basically kept things running, which is amazing that you know, the, the, the tenacity that Wayne had uh, when it's like, oh, sorry, we can't get a bearing for that tractor. It's like, fine, we'll work through the night and we'll make one. Um, so we are very much a make-a-plan story, um, and... Uh, you know, nothing, nothing stopped us, you know, uh, we might not have managed to do it straight away, but we'd always find a way of making it happen. Uh, we had an incredible uh, selection of um, um, friends and, and, and the roundtable community. I can't emphasize just how strong that community is where we were. So um, the story built up, we started being intimidated on the land. Um, we kept getting gate rattling at night um, and throwing stones onto the roof, um, setting fire to the, the crops. Um, we'd be having um, equipment stolen off the land um, and then we just kept going. We weren't going to let it get to us. Um, and then Wayne was dragged off with an AK-47 to his head. Now, for those people who do know my husband, he's not a little man. He's a great big beast of a man. Um, so Wayne, Wayne is a super fit sportsman. Um, give you an idea, he's got a 50 inch chest and it's just solid muscle. Um, he, he was a bodybuilder in his youth and he's continued to do so. Um, he's incredibly fit, but he got dragged off with an AK-47 to his head and beaten black and blue, absolutely black and blue. I had no idea where they'd taken him. Uh, we had the most amazing uh, lawyer, uh, a guy called Mr. Kujinga, and I'd phone him at like two in the morning and I'd say, Clement, they've taken him. Uh, can you go find him? And God knows how he did it, but he always managed, he found Wayne and he brought him home. We never fought back because the farmers that did fight back didn't come home. They were fined, mutilated or shot or, or uh, just beaten so badly they never came home. So he didn't fight back um, and he would come home. It happened the second time. They never broke anything, but they absolutely destroyed him. But Wayne wasn't going to give in. And then on the 1st of um, August 2002, uh, we got what's called a Section 8, and uh, it's basically the compulsory acquisition of the land. And Wayne said, we're not fighting this. They can have it. They can have it. Next thing we knew, Wayne's chucked in the back of a lorry again, taken off again. So it's the same day that the, um, the, um, the order came through, um, and he was gone for three days. Um, I thought Wayne had been beaten badly the first two times. The third time, I didn't think he would make it. I really didn't. He did. He did. So that was great. But when he came home, we made that decision that night. Right. We're not fighting this. We're not going to court. They can have the land. So we contacted the constable uh, who was in charge of the acquisition. 
and we said, right, we're not going to court. What's the next step? He says, you've got 24 hours to get off. This wasn't the 90 days that was in the, in the standard. We've been given 24 hours. So the unfortunate part is everything on the farm was linked to the farm accounts. So all the money was linked to the bank accounts of the farm, all the equipment was linked to the farm. So every, it was a business. Everything was linked to the farm. But because they seized the farm, they seized everything, absolutely everything. We packed three suitcases under watchful eye of veterans. And we walked down our own driveway with three kids and three suitcases and we walked away. And there was nothing left. We had nowhere to go. So we phoned our, um, our chairman of our round table, Pete Kuhn, and we explained what had happened and we told him we couldn't get into town. And he came out and picked us up, put us in the back of his pickup and took us to his home. I don't know where we would have been without round table. I don't know where we would have gone and I don't know what our story would have been if it hadn't been for round table. Pete took us home and at this point Wayne and I were both so numb and the kids the kids just thought we were going over to spend the night with Uncle Uncle Pete and Auntie Eve. We'd stay there often because they were in town. But what Table did do is they had a, a mass meeting at the Round Table Shack, which was our meeting, uh, our meeting house basically, where we used to go every Friday for our round table meetings. Uh, the kids used to come along and the wives come along and we always had a lovely time. And uh, we went and we, we basically had a meeting and um, we weren't the first farmers to be attacked. But the fact that we'd lost everything, you know, some farmers had managed to get all their equipment or if they'd been able to get their livestock, we couldn't. We walked out with three cases and pretty much broke because they took everything. So um, unbelievably, what the tablers had done is they, they said, is there any chance you're getting a British passport? So we said, we don't know, um, but we can go to the British Embassy. Our parents were born there. We'll see. So we had um, a four hour drive from Matari into Harare. One of our friends drove us in and we went to the British Embassy and explained the situation. And they told us to go off and have a coffee and come back in a couple of hours. We went back and we were both issued with a British passport. I cannot tell you how relieved I was at that point in time. We went back to Matari that night, um, and again, this was the uh, this was on the Tuesday night when we got back, and um, they said, "Right, what's next?" And they said, "We've bought you tickets to the UK. You're leaving on Sunday." So um, we packed up. We said our final farewells to the most incredible, incredible tablers, and it was the hardest thing to say goodbye to them. And um, they drove, drove us to the airport. They paid for our airfare. What I didn't know, they'd given Wayne 300 pounds cash. God knows where they got that because you cannot get foreign currency in Zimbabwe. I have no idea where he got that, but he was given the, the money. Um, and we got on the plane and we flew out and we landed in Gatwick on the Monday morning. We had nowhere to live. We didn't have a job. Um, we hadn't told the kids quite what had happened at this point in time. Um, and when we landed, um, one thing we hadn't done because there was nothing I could do about it and I didn't have time. I arrived with three kids with no visa to get into this country. And we got to the immigration and I didn't have a visa for the kids. We were both on British passports, but my kids were on Zim passports. Explained it to the immigration and we must have sat at the airport for I don't know how long. And we explained what had happened and they very, thank God, I don't know who was looking after us that day. But they let us in on the understanding that we take the kids straight to the home office first thing in the morning, which is what we did. We got to the home office, explained the situation again. And again, I think somebody was looking after us because our kids were given indefinite leave to remain stamps in their Zimbabwean passports, which basically opened the doors for us to actually start a new life. Wayne started looking for work straight away. Um, and within t uh, 48 hours, he'd managed to secure a job at Abbey Quilting. Um, in Dagenham and that's where our story will continue which I'll, I'll explain a little bit more but that's pretty much how um, the evasion happened but what I I don't have as a result I don't have many photographs because it was very limited to what we could take with us um, the next bit I'm going to show you is a clip um, of a family that we know uh, who were invaded in 2015 so quite a bit later than we were um, but her story is my story 
So I'm going to show you this little video um, and then we'll continue with the story. We are not giving up. I don't believe that the way that it is being done is fair at all. We've had no say in the matter. We, we have taken, um, or the government has taken us to court over the farm. We won the case, but they are still adamant that they're going to throw us out. So, of course, we're not going to give up because it is not fair what is going on. If the government takes the farms like this, what are, what are the people going to do? And what are we going to have when we don't have employ employment? The m most important thing is if we don't have employment, we are going to starve with the children and everything will be more difficult for us. The case was dismissed from court because the government showed no interest in our farm. Because, maybe because it's a productive farm, I don't know. It, they have their various reasons. But we were then told that this farm was delisted. One of the constables who came today was in the group who originally came to tell the settlers on this farm that this farm was now delisted and they had one year to pack their bags basically and get off the property. So um, the rescue mission, I explained um, that Roundtable came to rescue us which we would really have been in a pickle. Um, so the lady in the top right-hand corner is Yves Kun. Uh, she was the wife of, uh, she is the wife of the, the round table um, chairman at the time. And it was Evie that came to rescue us. Um, this photo is actually taken at Eve's house. Um, and without her, I, I, she was my rock uh, and she held us together. The lady that you can see in the top left is a lady called Lee. And she absolutely was there for my kids. Uh, she made sure that they were safe. Uh, she made sure that they were looked after. These photographs were taken when I went back home a little while ago. So much happier environment. Um, but without these two women, uh, I don't know where they'd be. And they're very much part of the Round Table family. And um, unbelievable support from these two women and, and their, their retrospective husbands. Uh, the lady in the bottom um, is my sister. Um, Jane um, has been, she hasn't been able to physically be with me, but she was always at the end of the phone. Um, she was always there to give me support and guidance. Um, and she's, she has been my rock. Um, and without her, without her understanding, um, I don't think I would be in the place I am today. So without Jane and Lee and Eve, I think my story could have been very different. So unfortunately, when we left, um, we had to leave people behind. Um, the lady you can see um, in the picture is Spiwe. Spiwe was with us from the time I got married. She saw me have my babies. 
um, and we used to laugh that she was their black mommy because she treated my kids like her own. Uh, Spiwe had two kids, Tafadwa and, and Kudzi, and her boys uh, were very much part of our family as well. So they would swim in the pool with the kids and they would play tennis together whenever it was a birthday party. Uh, they were always involved. So they were in my house more than they were probably in, in their own home. Um, and uh, Spira lived on our property and she, she was absolutely my, my support and um, I couldn't have done half the stuff I did without her. Uh, she came on holiday whenever we went away and she was just incredible. Uh, to the side is her brother, um, Coffee. Um, Coffee used to look after, uh, after the dogs and our own uh, domestic animals, um, as well as dealing with um, our swimming pool um, and the, the local gardener and then the vegetables that we need for the house. Coffee was incredible. Coffee actually had a club foot um, and he couldn't get work on the field. So um, he came and helped us um, in the house itself. And he was absolutely a fantastic young man with a fantastic sense of humor. Um, didn't speak any English, he only spoke Shona, but as well as I spoke Shona, uh, we did just fine. Um, a really nice young, and, and these two people um, have been on the farm for many generations, and uh, ex-Mozambique, um, and uh, when the invasion took place, these two in particular were out of somewhere to live. Um, and um, I, I wasn't able to keep in contact with them. Um, I've I don't know if they're around anymore or what's happened to them, but to have two very precious people like this ripped from us with no notice was a tough call and I'll always be grateful to these two for what they did and and how much they were very much part of our family so um as I'm explaining uh, we got on a plane uh, and we landed at Gatwick uh, I'd like to point out when I flew I had three suitcases three kids and my sewing machine so for those who know me I'm a bit of an avid sewer and Wayne had bought me a sewing machine as my wedding present, and I was not leaving that behind. So uh, that did come with. I still got it and I still use it today. Um, so it must have looked quite a, quite a sight arriving uh, with a sewing machine and these kids. So um, we moved into a little house in Dagenham. Um, it was a bit of a shock to the to the system, I might add, from a lovely five bedroom farmhouse to a two up two down. In Dagenham uh, with no garden. Uh, what you can see there on the drive is where my kids used to play. Um, they were not used to this. Michael was used to jumping on a motorbike and racing around. Um, he, uh, he was used to big open space and suddenly he couldn't go outside and <laughs> it was just a big culture shock. Um, it was tough, really tough. We'd gone from a third world country to a first world country and we didn't know how it worked. We had a big learning curve. Things like, um, I'll give it a sake, when we came out, Danny was still in nappies. Um, I used to use terry tiling nappies in Zimbabwe. You didn't have disposables. I didn't know what those were. We were old fashioned. So terry tiling nappies with pins. Um, and um, I went off to the shops looking for chick, which is what you sterilize and wipe the nappies with. I couldn't find it. I didn't know it was called bleach. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I got myself in a bit of a, a situation in, in Asda and I broke down crying and it was actually the manager in Asda who came and helped me and explained my situation. Um, yeah, so I had to had to learn incredibly quickly how things work in this country. Um, I wasn't ready for it. Uh, we basically had a week's notice we were going. So it's tough. It's tough. But Wayne got work straight away. Within 48 hours, he had a job. We managed to rent a house, which we went later on to buy. Um, and you know what, all well, I'm so grateful Wayne's mother insisted that before he did anything in his life, he get a qualification and he qualified as a fitter and turner, as a machinist. And thank God he did because that's what kept him employed. Um, so uh, new start, new borders. So we, we arrived in the UK uh, now with the kids secure in that they had the indefinite leave to remain. Um, and we were all good to start our new life, not quite knowing what to do. For some reason, whilst I was in Dagenham, I never thought to contact Lady Circle. Or round table. I was so shell-shocked what we'd been through, so traumatized what we'd been through, that was the last thing I thought of. But thinking about it now, that should be the first thing I thought about because I would have had the support of the round table family and I didn't. So I struggled for 18 months without that. However, we have the UK help. There are four ladies in the UK I will be internally grateful forever. The first is Vivi Beast, who has become my rock. The second is Vicky Conway, who was always there for me, um, always supporting me, picking me up, 
physically and emotionally. Um, she's an incredible lady. And then Michelle Chapman. Michelle was the first circler I met. So what happened is when we uh, when we moved to Dagenham, somebody tried to steal Michael in a white van uh, when he was walking to school. Um, we were living on the Barking Gas Going Estate. It's not a good area. I didn't really know that at the time. Having arrived at the country, knowing nothing about the area, I was oblivious and I was not streetwise at all. We don't have to worry about these sort of things in, in Zim. Um, suddenly we were alerted to the drugs and prostitution and, and problems that we have in the community. Um, anyway, we decided actually this is maybe not the best place for our kids. Um, and we relocated to Lincolnshire, to a little town called Sleaford, just outside Grantham. Um, and that's where I met Michelle. And Michelle took me under her wing and we've been friends ever since, since 2003. And she has absolutely looked after me. She kind of picked me up from home, took me to the meetings. Um, I was really shy, didn't know anyone. Um, and she just made me feel so welcome. And I'll always be grateful for that. And then we moved from Lincolnshire um, and we then moved uh, to um, Staffordshire because we had had um, an offer of a very good job um, with um, the breweries. Uh, so we moved to Burton-on-Trent. Um, and that's when I met Vivi, when I contacted the Litchfield Ladies Circle. And um, she was the one that really pulled, pulled, me, pulled the real me out, let, let me be me again. Um, and um, she was very much part of my presidential journey. She was my diary lady. Um, and I'll always be grateful for her. And um, yeah, we do a lot of things together now. Um, and there was a little quote I found from um, the internet. And I think it really sums up. Um, the support that I've had. Good friends help you find the important things when you've lost them. And I had lost everything. So my friends in the UK have helped me find my smile again. They've helped me hope again. And they've given me courage. And you know what? That's all I needed. I just needed to believe in myself again. And I just needed to find the real me again. And through the support of the Roundtable family, I've been able to do that. Um, and just to realize just you know, what a great place we are and what's more, what a great organization we're part of. So once we'd been here for a little while, Danny, um, our youngest, was really poorly. Um, we thought he was celiac, very similar to myself. I can't eat anything um, like wheat or grains and stuff. And Dan just couldn't keep anything up or down. And he was getting thinner and thinner and grayer and grayer. Um, ran various tests and uh, they discovered he had the hydropylori bacteria, which they think he must have picked up in Africa. Um, and we treated that. We thought he was getting better, but he wasn't. So they put a tube up and up him and down him to find out what was going on uh, to discover that Danny actually had tumors um, in his stomach. Uh, Danny went through a series of chemo. And as you see, these are the pictures when his hair started growing back again. Um, I thought we were actually going to kill this young man, but yeah, he's pulled through. Um, not only that, Dan is also epileptic and Dan is also autistic. We didn't know any of this when we came out. Um, I get incredibly angry uh, when I hear people run down the NHS. When you come from a country where you can't even buy paracetamol, when you get malaria when you're pregnant and you risk losing your baby, when there's nobody to look after your baby when he's two hours old, you can't get the medication to help his seizures and he's having 30 to 40 seizures a day then you know what medication is all about. We arrived in this country, he was given all the medication he needed. He was given every specialist you can imagine. He was, he was diagnosed as autistic, which I don't think ever would have happened in Zimbabwe. He was given one-on-one -on -one support from school. Daniel also, uh, going back a little bit, uh, when Daniel was seven months old in Zimbabwe, he contracted meningitis and he nearly died. Um, we couldn't get a drug, it was called rosafin that we needed. Daniel's allergic to penicillin. And normal uh, meningitis, you bang in the penicillin 24 hours later, thank you very much, you're okay. But I couldn't give him penicillin because he couldn't have it. So we needed rosafin, but there was none in the country at all. My sister at the time was in London, she was working uh, for Goldman Sachs. And um, I phoned her and explained the situation and we um, faxed, it was faxes in those days, we faxed through Daniel's prescription to her office. She then went to her doctor, explained the situation. He wrote up his prescription 
and she went and purchased it from the pharmacy um, and she got it onto the next DHL flight back to Zimbabwe. The flight landed um, on the Tuesday morning um, in Harare, which is three hours away, but we couldn't leave Daniel at this point. He was in hospital, not that they could do anything for him, but he was just on a trip. Um, and his paediatrician came to me and he basically said to me, it's too late, you need to say goodbye. He's not going to make it. We haven't got time for the drugs to get here. Anyway, um, one of the tablers from Matari jumped in his vehicle. He drove to Harare three hours. I was waiting on the runway for the flight to land. Um, he had a contact in DHL. Thank the great roundtable family we have. He had a contact in roundtable uh, in the DHL, and they pulled the shipment out. Um, and as soon as that plane landed. Somebody came off the plane and gave it to him. Um, he went through the customs. He knew somebody that, you know, it's who you know in Zimbabwe, not what you know. He got through and back to the to the hospital at two o'clock on the Tuesday afternoon. They administered the drugs to Dan. We didn't know if it was going to work, but we were going to give it everything we had. Dan pulled through. We still have Dan, um, but he did some damage. Uh, Daniel um, had quite a bit of damage done because uh, of the meningitis. And as a result, he now has a learning dis uh, disability. Um, you wouldn't know to look at the young man. He's an amazing young man, but he's struggled. But you know what? He's had the support in this country. He's had one-on-one -on -one teachers. He's had speech therapists, occupational therapists, uh, psychologists, any, anything with an ist on it, he's had it. And you know what? I paid nothing for it other than my tax that I pay every month for my wages, which I more than happy give over, and the NI. I cannot, I cannot tell you how angry I get when people start moaning about the NHS and I just think you have no idea what you've got when you've come from something where you had nothing and I will always be grateful because if what had happened in Zimbabwe had ha hadn't happened we never would have picked up Dan's tumours we would never picked up the hydropleury he'd never been diagnosed as autistic I don't think Dan would be here anymore and that's a cool cold hard fact actually what happened to us saved this young man's life and I will always be grateful for that, always. So what does the Roundtable family mean to our family? It's more than family. It's the heartbeat of our, our lives. It saved us. It's given us a second chance in life. And I tell you what, we have taken that second chance with both hands and more, and we've given back. And I think this is why I was so passionate with Lady Circle whilst I was a circle, circler, uh, why I went on to take on the role of president and why I went on to the international. I wanted to give back just a smidgen of what we'd been given. The fact that we'd had our lives taken away from us, but Round Table gave it back to us. And I cannot tell you how we were grateful for that. And I want you to remember when you go to a meeting, or you've got here's a tabler or a circler or a tangent member or a 41er who wants to leave for one reason or another. Find out what the real reason is. Because I can tell you what, when they know what the support they can get and how you are there for them every step of the way and you can support them with everything that they do, they will realise the value of what we've got. Talk to the youngsters. Tell them about Roundtable. Tell them about Circle. It's a story we don't shout about. It's a story we don't tell enough about. There are a lot of people out there like me, maybe not the same journey, but mentally, physically, and emotionally in a really, really tough place. And you know what? Roundtable, Lady Circle, Tangent, and 41 Club can give them the strength they need because actually you can't always do it on your own. And mental health is a big part of this. And you know what? It wasn't really talked about much when we came over in the 90s. They talk about it now, and I'm very grateful for it. But it was the round table that keep family that kept us sane and kept us together. And, you know, I could never pay back our friends um, in, in Matari for what they did and for how they rescued us and how they gave us a second chance. How do you pay that back? And that's very much why I'm so passionately active in what I do. I sadly haven't joined Tangent yet. It's not a, it's not a never, it's a maybe. Mainly because um, I work shifts, I do days and nights, and I work the most crazy roster. I can't 
commit to being off, say, every Thursday night or every Wednesday lunch. I, I can't do it because my shifts change all the time. So until I'm in a position that I can commit to being at the meetings, unfortunately, I just come in as a as a visitor and um, come join in events like this, which is amazing. So um, our journey has continued. Um, Wayne uh, has gone on to become a global uh, engineering manager for Ocado. Um, he is looking after all the international sites that he's built around the world. He's done very well for himself, but I tell you what, he's worked damn hard to get there. Um, and I'm very proud of this man. He's held us together. He's been our rock. And you know, when things were tough, he never once led on, he wasn't coping. And it's only all the years later that you actually have that conversation. How were you feeling at the time? God knows how he held it together, because I don't know. But he did. He did. And without him, I don't think we'd be the family we are. I've got three amazing kids, uh, Mike, Dan and Shan, which you see in the top picture, alternative, really good young men and, la and a lovely young lady. Um, Mike is now a computer software engineer um, for a, a pretty big company in London. He would never have had the opportunity of going to university in Zimbabwe. We couldn't have afforded it. Danny, despite all his problems, um, is a qualified carpenter now. Um, and he's now uh, moved over to Ocado and he's training to be a robotic engineer. I cannot tell you how proud I am of that young man, but he couldn't have done it without the support of the, the UK network, without our friends, and more overtly, we couldn't have done it without the Roundtable family. And then we've got beautiful Shan, uh, Shanna Lee. She hates being called Shanna Lee, she likes to call Shanna. Um, Shanna Lee graduated from university as well, um, which was just to have two kids go through university is quite something. Um, Shanna Lee also works for Ricardo. Um, she's training to be an operations manager, taking after her mummy. So um, I've got three three kids, two of them work for Ricardo. Mojave works for Ricardo, I work for Ricardo. So um, they've very much become our family as well. Um, and um, I'm very happy that our story has got a good ending. Some families didn't have that, that lucky story. Some families not here anymore to tell the tale. Um, and their journey is not anything to be envied. It's tough. And... Um, a lot of them have landed up destitute, um, so there's a lot of um, farmers who are doing particularly well living on the streets now um, and dying because they can't feed themselves, and it's a tragic situation. So I'm going to move over to questions and answers. Um, so I'll hand back to you, Jim, if that's okay. I'm just going to stop sharing. There we go. Sorry, Jim, you're on mute. <laughs> That's better. There we go. I um, I do my best in person of Marcel Marceau. There we go. Um, I was, I've got a great question here. There some great questions here. Um, uh, M. Lloyd Davis, I was chairman of Roundtable in, I'm hoping pronouncing this correctly, Kitwe, in 1976. Yeah, in Zambia, yeah. As part of the um, Roundtable Central Africa. But when Amazing. The border, yeah, when the, when the border was closed, we became... Association Roundtable, I'm guessing Zim or Zam. I'm going to go. Zam, to it'll be Zam. It'll be Zambia, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It kept close contact with Roundtable Rhodesia. I moved to Botswana in 1981 and we met many Rhodesians fleeing with what they could put on a truck. Yeah. You, the question is do you regret not leaving earlier? No, because we, we were always hopeful that it would come right we were always hopeful that we'd settle down uh, because our land wasn't that huge in comparison to some of the other farms. Uh, we always had, we always had the, the belief that it, we were just having a rough time and, and, you know, it, it would come right and settle down and we would move on because we, to us, that was home. We, we didn't see any need to move on. We were forced into the situation. Um, Emil also asks um, that they visited um, Rhodesia Salisbury regarded as the God's own country. I'm sure yeah. some, Yorkshiremen might disagree. Yeah. <laughs> there are probably um, a lot of Yorkshiremen there, actually. Yeah. Um, they said they visited Leopard's Rock, which is a oh thing. yes, that was just down the road from our farm. Actually, yeah. it was up in the Wumba, um, so probably half an hour from where we lived. Yeah, beautiful. Oh. So you just preempted the question: Was your farm near there? And it was. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, did um, Colin McKenzie ask? Did Wayne join Table in the UK? He did. Um, he joined uh, Sleaford Round Table. 
Um, but then he went on to work nights. So um, that just kind of threw that in the, in the spanner in the works a bit. And then when we went to Litchfield, he used to go along to quite a few of the events, but he didn't actually join as a member, but he'd go along to quite a few of the events. But it all came down to the shifts that he worked. So he, again, couldn't commit to it. But hugely supportive of what I did. Um, and he, he's attended a lot of events. So he's been, you know, very actively involved. Mark, I can remember when we did the Coast to Coast Challenge on the bike. Yes. Yes, we and, did. Yes. Um, it was, Wayne was absolutely amazing on that. Yeah. Um, and put it this way, you know, the story of you saying he's a big lad and all that. I wouldn't want to have a fight with him. I can <laughs> tell you. Um, Dom, um, where are we going? Uh, we have uh, Peter Robson asks, what is the current situation in Zimbabwe? Is there any prospect of things improving? Uh, White's was, well, actually, this, uh, we'll, we'll do them one at a time. Are, yep. are things improving? No, they're getting worse. Uh, yeah. Wayne's brother is still there. Um, I have been fighting with the passport office here to try and get him his British passport because his passport expired, but there is no embassy in Zimbabwe right now. Um, I got uh, confirmation yesterday that uh, Vincent's passport has been approved. So he's coming home. Well, he's coming home. He's coming here to his new home. Um, I just now to get him out. Um, so that's my next story. And I'll need to get somehow get the passport to him. Um, no, it's not improving. Um, to give you an idea of Vincent, Vincent is out of work, has been out of work for the last 36 months. Vincent is a qualified butcher. He's a very good butcher, actually. Um, and because there's no livestock, there's no need for him. So the butchers have closed. All, all um, produce is coming in from South Africa. Uh, it has to be paid for in foreign currency. It's illegal to hold foreign currency in Zimbabwe. If you're caught with it, you'll be thrown in jail. So it is a real catch-22 situation. So the situation right now is uh, Wayne and I pay for uh, groceries for Vincent. Um, and they, I pay for once a week to a UK bank account. Um, to somebody I don't know, but I, I deposit money in there uh, once a week and uh, groceries are dropped off with Vincent at the house. If I didn't do that, Vincent would start to death and he's not the only family. It's critical, absolutely critical. There's no running water. Um, they don't have the chemicals to run the reservoirs. So if you don't have a borehole, you're stuck. Uh, fuel is incredibly difficult to get hold of. Uh, you can only buy it on the black market and you have to pay foreign currency for it. Um, so there's a, an illegal foreign currency trade going on. Um, it's, um, it's tough. It's there's no electricity. Um, so everybody's running on uh, paraffin and candles. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting worse. It's, and there's no maintenance of the roads, the potholes. You see these jokes with like, oh, a lorry's driven into a pothole. Like, ha ha. Actually, it really is happening. Traffic lights don't work. There's the, if you need the police, you have to go and fetch them because they don't have vehicles to get to you. Um, to give you an idea, um, we posted, uh, well, the, the passport office posted Vincent a letter. It took nine months to get to him. <laughs> nine months. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just falling apart. Uh, it's not going to get fixed either. And sadly, South Africa is going very much the same way, but a lot quicker than we did. Um, I suppose the follow-up question is now that Robert Mugabe's died, um, the new guy, is, is he any better? No, um, Emerson Managua, uh, we had great hopes um, with Emerson Managua, but uh, he's got quite a brutal past. So um, in, I think it was the early 80s, uh, a lot of the, so there's two tribes in Zimbabwe. There's the Shona, uh, who are from Mashona land, and then there's the Ndebele from Matabele land. They don't like each other. Um, so, um, so the, 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 the Matabilis are from the Bulawayo area, um, and they definitely don't see eye to eye. Now, Emerson Managua, Managua um, basically did a bit of a genocide on the, uh, the Matabilis, um, I think it was in the 80s, I can't remember the exact year, um, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Matabilis killed by the Shona, um, just trying to eliminate the race, um, and he was known as the Crocodile. Uh, because uh, he's all quietly on the bank. And then, as you know, crocodiles will just smack and take you. Uh, so um, he, he, promised, he promised a lot to, to, the, to the population of what he was going to do and how he was going to fix it and how he was going to make things better. Uh, if anything, it's worse now. Um, they're just raping the country with all the money they can get. Uh, they, they're pillaging all the, the, the diamonds, which you probably heard the, the story of the blood diamonds, and they're coming out of Zimbabwe. Um, but it, the money is not being reinvested in the country at all. It's just been they're lining pockets in Switzerland and buying fancy houses in Europe. And, and, and a lot of the, um, 
the uh, political uh, people in Zimbabwe have actually been banned from Europe. We don't want them here. Uh, the bad news. Um, and yeah, they've made these big promises, but they've not delivered. They just continue to ravage the country and, they, and they're not they're not inputting. And I think the damage is so far now, I, I can't see how it's going to be rectified. It's certainly not going to happen in my lifetime. Um, just to remind people, if they want to ask questions, just put it in the chat and I'll post them. Um, I'll make sure Ruth gets them. Um, uh, are there any white farmers left in Zimbabwe? Yep. Yeah, we do have a few. Um, so what's happened, I think they've realized the error of their ways. So they've actually been asking the white farmers to come back and, and giving them land. So not giving it to them, but they're letting them use it rent free. So the land will never belong to them, but they're letting it farm. So you will probably see in places like Aldi's and places like that, you can get the Mange 2 or sh uh, Sugar Snaps. And they're coming from a little town called Guelo or Gueru. Um, and that's been the new, fa the farmers that they've enticed back from Zambia to come back into Zimbabwe um, and they're trying to get the tobacco industry going again. Um, but I, I just fear they, they're, they're going to get up and running again and get the farms going properly again and the same thing will happen again. I just don't trust them. I, 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 and that's a personal opinion of mine, mm. just after what we've been through. I just don't trust anyone there anymore. No. Um, are the whites still being intimidated over there? So another Peter Robson question. It's three great questions there. Yeah. So um, they are not to the, the extent that happened whilst we were there, um, but it is happening, but it's more, it's more crime now rather than uh, land, land invasions. Um, so because unemployment is so high, um, a, a lot of the, the population are just swarming on those who've got and taking. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the hijacking uh, is done at gunpoint and it's, it's quite brutally taken off them. So it's not so much for the land, it's for the possessions. So you're not tempted to go back then? Mm -mm. No? Okay. So um, I did I did go home September 2019. Um, it was a tough journey. I went home, well, uh, my best friend who actually introduced me to Wayne, uh, she sadly passed away. So I went home for her funeral. Um, but I only went home to say goodbye to Sandy. Uh, otherwise, there was no reason for me to be there. We do go back to Africa, but we go to Cape Town. We love Cape Town. Cape Town's amazing. That's great. I recommend Cape Town to everybody. Um, and I recommend Zambia. Zambia is beautiful. Go to Victoria Falls from the Zambian side. The Zimbabwe's will hate me telling you this, but the Zambezi and the river and the falls is actually better from the Zambian side. <laughs> but don't let them tell you, I told you that. But yeah, so yeah, I recommend it's a great holiday destination, but Zim unfortunately just is not the place to be. Uh, we, to give you an idea, if you are traveling, say from Harare to Kariba, which is an amazing, huge, big lake, um, which uh, fantastic, fantastic holidays on there. Um, we have what we call the uh, the dollar dollar. So the dollar dollar is basically the locals set up um, two oil drums on the other side of the road with a, with a pole. And it's a toll bridge and you get stopped and you have to pay the one US dollar to pass the toll. And if you don't pass the US dollar, you're not going anywhere. And you probably get about 50 of those on the way to Kariba. So it gets quite expensive traveling anyway. So it just laws taken over. They just do what they want to. Um, it's not a question. But Don Mitchell said uh, that his family were in Dubai round table and his wife became very ill and the round table there and in the UK supported so much. Um, and also that had family in SR. I'm not sure where SR is, but. Was it SA maybe, which would be South Africa? Could be. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of the things you talked about. Um, at first, Dubai Roundtable was affiliated to Roundtable East Africa. And just saying thank you for such a moving talk. Pleasure. Um, is there any more questions from anybody? Yes, Alan Thompson, you, you've just waved. I've caught your wave there. Um, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, Alan? Yes, Ruth, not a question, but I may be showing my age with what I'm going to say. <laughs> the very first table that we hosted on an international visit <clears throat> way back in the early 70s was Roger Giles from Salisbury Number 1. Um, I know Roger's family. Ah. Roger. We Roger and Dad, so Tony Goldie was my dad, and Roger Baker were chums. Um, yeah, they spent many, I know him well as, as a child, obviously, but yeah, that, oh, wow. Well, <laughs> of course, with his height, he used to pick up our three girls, let them touch the roof. <laughs> they, they thought this was great. Uh, <laughs> we often wondered 
with the way things went, what happened to Roger or where they went? Or... A lot of people actually came to the UK, but we had a huge uh, exodus into Australia and New Zealand. Um, so that's where, and South Africa. So it's where most of the people moved to from the 80s. Um, mm -hmm. So a, a big influx into South Africa. And then uh, things started to deteriorate in South Africa. A lot of people then come on to, to Europe. But a lot of people have gone into Australia. Very similar climate, um, a lot of similar farming. So it, it kind of was a good fit for them going into Australia. Yeah. Well, if you're in touch with Roger's fa uh, family, you can say there was a couple from Inverurie and Aberdeenshire. Remember I will. Visit. I'll ask my dad actually if he's still in touch with the family. Yes, I do remember them very well. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you, Alan. Um, Don, thank you very much for clarifying. SR is Southern Rhodesia. Ah, uh, yes. That well. was, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you for that, Don. Um, uh, Mike Hayden asks How are the non farmer tablers who helped you existing there, or have they left too? I would, of all our table friends, there is only one remaining. Um, uh, he's an accountant and he's based in Harare, but he also has a business um, um, out of the country as well. So I don't know if that's what's keeping him going there, um, but everybody else has left. So uh, we're still in contact, actually, thank goodness to Facebook, because that's how we stay in contact with everyone. So some have gone to Canada. Uh, we've got some friends that have moved over to New Zealand, quite a lot in Australia, quite a few went to South Africa, and we've got a lot here in the UK a lot yes, um uh, Ni nigel campling I, I do believe this might be nigel from south end um i haven't spoken to for some time he said question please um nigel do you want to unmute yourself and ask uh hi good, uh, good evening everybody uh now not south end i actually live on the isle of wight these days ah, all very nice yeah, it is very nice ruth thank you very much my daughter uh, lives in zimbabwe Okay. She's a wildlife vet uh, running the um, lion and antelope park west of Harare. Uh, Amiri? Uh, west of Harare. No, is, um, is it the Amiri Park? No, it's the antelope, uh, lion and antelope park. Lion, okay, fine. Okay, yeah. by, by Lake Mac? No, I believe so, yeah. Lake Mutariqui, I think is its new name. Yeah, yeah um, currently uh, there's an investment opportunity there, which I'm trying not to do, uh, <laughs> which you probably would understand. Um, did you come across Mandy Retzloff when you were out there who wrote 101 Horses, very similar to your experience? No, I didn't. I'll have to look that up. So Mandy. Oh, OK. It's a wonderful book. Um, yeah. Met Mandy when we were in Mozambique a little while back. Um, but, um, uh, you know, very, very similar to the experience you've had. Uh, had to, to, to up everything and, and go. Um, but obviously, uh, wish you well interested in everything to do with Zimbabwe because my little girl's there but uh, yeah. thanks for your story thank you thank you Nigel uh, any more questions if, you, if you're if you're not on screen I'm looking very very is Alan Thompson wait are you waving your finger again Alan I was uh, yeah, just sure. uh, Ruth if you are in touch with him we still have the Salisbury round table number one banner hanging in the house here amazing oh that's, oh that's fantastic unfortunately we didn't bring anything of our, our memorabilia with because it, we we're very limited to what we could pack and, and bring with us so uh yeah we had to leave a lot behind but that's yeah that's quite cool when actually when i got married we got um married at the church of the nazarene which was across the way um to the uh, harari number one uh, shack which was their meeting house so we had the reception at the round table venue um, so that was very special to us as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands uh, going up. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Colin McKenzie to do the vote of thanks. Over to you, Colin. Just on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Ruth. Um, oh, what a contrasting story. Uh, I mean, it's just. Uh, it's breathtaking to be honest and so sad as well it started off so happy with uh, you know your uh, youth in Zimbabwe and growing up uh, you know he, uh, meeting hunky Wayne <laughs> and uh, building your life with your three children Mike Dan and Shana Lee I think yeah. got that yeah. right correct yeah and uh, however many elephants as well uh, we did indeed <laughs> <laughs> uh, also your time and uh is it Marandera? Marandera, yeah. Lady Circle, yeah. yeah. And I uh, quite like the idea of them being the table table legs 
I think that happens quite a lot over here, to be honest, as well. <laughs> Circlers holding up table. Um, and then obviously the, the, the change uh, in your life uh, with the land acquisitions and the, the reforms and the farm invasions is just so sad. I remember watching it um, uh, on the news. I was actually over in Papua New Guinea working on a farm over there. So I had a lot of friends who had friends in uh, Zimbabwe and farms over there that, that you know, so I, I was seeing it quite firsthand on the news as well. Um, and sort of can relate to quite a lot of what you were talking about there. And it, it was really hard to hear about um, Wayne's um, beatings as well. That's just, uh, I can't imagine what you were thinking and what you were going through and, and what the children were as well. Um, but then obviously the, the power of uh, circle and table, um, having you come, you know, getting you back out there, uh, back to the UK and then building your new life and uh, your new lives in Dagenham, then Lincolnshire. Um, it's just really great to see the strength of table, circle, as we all know, but that's really the extreme strength I think you've seen, you know, where it, uh, they've, they've helped you with your life. Um, I guess finally I can, I can really see that Africa is still well and truly in your blood. And uh, it just remains for me to say that on behalf of 41 Club, and the Round Table family. I'd like to thank you for a very personal insight into your life. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. I have to un unmute everyone. <laughs> I can see you all clapping. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>